This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 481. Are you worried that this decision, if it goes badly, will make you look really stupid in front of the board and you might get fired? See, that's emotion, but we don't like to talk about that. All top leaders make mistakes simply because they're human. In fact, the more senior and successful they are, the more susceptible they are to making errors due to overconfidence and perhaps hubris. But as our guest today demonstrates, this doesn't have to be your fate. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, a podcast that's dedicated to your personal and professional growth, because I believe that if you want to achieve true success in business and in life, the first step is to become an intentional and consistent reader. This podcast is all about helping you start a reading habit or maintain the one you already have. And we do that each week by interviewing an author about their book. Today's guest is Constance Derricks. She's written a book called Meta Leadership, How to See What Others Don't and make great decisions. I'll ask her about some of the common leadership decision-making traps that leaders fall into and how they can be avoided, how you as a business leader can benefit from adopting a scientific thinking approach in your decision-making process, how you as a leader can manage the impact of your emotions on your thinking and behavior, especially during high-stakes situations, and much, much more. I want to personally invite you to join my Read to Lead Plus community online at Brown. Dot me. What will you find there? Well, you'll find a weekly book summary. That's right, a brand new written business book summary each and every week, plus all kinds of exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. Monthly Ask Me Anythings with me, monthly guest expert training calls with our, you guessed it, guest experts, challenges and workshops, member spotlight opportunities, and more content being added on a regular basis. It's all just nine bucks a month, just the cost of a couple of cups of coffee and you're in. In fact, you can even enjoy a 30-day free trial right now when you go to jeffbrown.me to see if you'll like it first. How cool is that? We'd love to add your name to our list of of movers and shakers of 400 plus people right now. It's the Read to Lead community with a Read to Lead Plus membership. Again, just nine bucks a month. Go to jeffbrown.me to get all the details. Constance Derricks is an internationally recognized expert in high-stakes decision-making who has advised leaders and delivered speeches in more than 20 countries. Founder and president of CD Consulting Group, she's worked with boards of directors and senior executives in Fortune 20 companies, private equity firms, and large not-for-profits. She's the author of High Stakes Leadership, Leading Through Crisis with Courage, Judgment, and Fortitude. And she's also a contributor to Harvard Business Review and Forbes, among other publications. She's taught strategic decision-making in Moscow, Russia, and lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Her new book is called Meta Leadership, How to See What Others Don't and Make Great Decisions. Well, Constance, it's a pleasure to have you back. I checked earlier today. It's hard to believe it's been nearly six years since you were here before, Uh, but welcome. Thanks Thanks for trying this again. Oh, absolutely. Well, as I recall, we had a fair amount of fun. We talked about a lot of important things. And hopefully that's something your readers, your listeners, sorry, really enjoy. That's something else I learned this morning is I read what I wrote nearly six years ago. Uh, I said these words. I learned during our time together that not only is she a master of her craft, she's also a hoot. That's right. (laughs) I don't remember the last time I laughed during an interview as much as I did this one. So no pressure. Be amusing. Yeah, it's called (laughs) edutainment. right? Right, right. Well, in this book, Meta Leadership, I think probably the first thing we need to do for the sake of context is to kind of have you define what that is in a bit more detail and how does it differ from traditional leadership approaches? Right. Well, I love the prefix meta. Mm. Um, I'm not super happy with Mark Zuckerberg for using it as a, a name by itself. The prefix meta means above or beyond. It's from the Greek. And if you think about you know, your listeners that, uh, you know, took uh, statistics, for example, or they're scientists, they understand what meta-analysis is. So, it's analyzing a group of studies, looking at the data in the aggregate, and seeing what different conclusions you might come up with. Metacognition for psychologists is thinking about thinking. So, a lot of leadership advice focuses on very specific things, 
that's good. Leaders can learn about and read about how to do strategy or how to make big organizational change or what to do in a crisis. And I've written about all of those things as well. But it occurred to me over my 25 years of advising boards and CEOs and executives that what really differentiated great leaders from good leaders. I'm not I'm not comparing great leaders to people who were big flops or frauds, but a great leader is able to change their altitude. Hmm. And they're able to use insight in a way that translates across every domain. So whether they're thinking about or making decisions about strategy, information technology, uh, the future of AI and their no matter what it is, they can dig in And they often do. And they can also come up and say, not just what am I thinking about this, but how am I thinking about it? How am I responding emotionally to this? How are the people around me responding and acting emotionally? Is anybody pressing an agenda? Okay, that's we know the answer to that question, right? right? Is anyone pressing an agenda? You know, how am I responding to these competing requests for my attention and, and a particular decision? And then finally, what do I tend to do? Mm. What are my default behaviors? And are those going to serve us well in this case or not? And then finally, the big one is what are our collective habits and default behaviors? Because that starts to smell like organizational culture. <laughs> and so meta leadership, rather than being a specific thing, it's a process, a way of thinking, being aware of your environment and engaging with what you know about your default behaviors. Mm. You know, I have to admit, I had to work really hard to listen through to your answer because I was triggered by the word statistics early on. Well, oh yeah, that's, that's true. It's funny because I, I grew up as a kid who just always said, I'm bad at math, I'm bad at math, I'm bad yeah. at math. Yeah. And so when I got into statistics, I, I nearly passed out. You know, I thought this is just going to be the end of me. And it mm. turns out statistics is just logical thinking with symbols. And some of your listeners will be like, well, that's what math is, Constance. You know, but I this dawned on me late in life. Turns out I'm really good in statistics, but don't ask me to add a column of numbers. I'm terrible. Yeah. When I was taking statistics, I was actually going through a divorce. I was in my my mid-20s and already going through a divorce and struggling oh with, with a lot of things. And I had a, a very generous prof who gave me a D plus in statistics just so that I wouldn't you know end up having to take it over again, I think. Well, maybe so that person wouldn't see you again. <laughs> well, maybe that too. <laughs> I don't know. I, I had that feeling myself <laughs> once or twice. Yeah. Let's get her out of here. Yeah. Well, what are some of the common leadership traps or decision-making traps that leaders tend to fall into? Well, the big one, which I write about in the book, every chapter is a dichotomy. The heading of the chapter is a dichotomy like strategy and tactics. So one of the biggest traps that leaders and every human being falls into is we oversimplify and dichotomize. Mm. Now, that's okay sometimes. You know, I like praline ice cream. I don't like strawberry ice cream which happens to be true. So I can dichotomize my ice cream flavors into good and bad mm. and no harm comes to anyone. You know, no animals were injured <laughs> in this decision. But when we have a very consequential decision, which is what I help leaders with big decisions, like do we buy this company or not? Who mm. should be our next CEO? Default thinking, dichotomizing is a trap because it's not just that we dichotomize. It's once we decide, humans have this really interesting way of clinging to our decisions. I know I'm right. Mm. I could have told you that a year ago. You know, all of those things mm. where we justify and rationalize our, the position that we've taken. That's a big that's a big trap for leaders and great leaders that I refer to as meta, who I provide a list in the back of the book of people I would nominate. They tend to be more skeptical of their own process when they're making a consequential decision. When you talk about default thinking, Constance, is mm -hmm. that the same thing when you, when you refer to black and white thinking or is that something else? Are you talking about the same thing? Um, black and white thinking or dichotomous thinking is an example 
of what we're talking about. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But default thinking would be I default to black and white thinking or I default to my default is to cling to a past decision. So there's a concept um, in psychology called the sunk loss fallacy. People mm-hmm. think that's from economics and it sort of is, but behavioral economics is really social psychology. Mm-hmm. And Daniel Kahneman was asked the question one time why it was called behavioral economics and not social psychology. And he gave a really true answer. He said, because economics has a better brand. <laughs> That's true. And there are other traps that mm. that we can talk about. There's there's a laundry list. But what I found was some people would read behavioral economics and they would find these uh, infographics online that had all these long lists of all the cognitive traps. And I thought nobody can hold those in their head. The point is we do these things because we're human, not because we're dumb. Mm. We're human, so we can't prevent them all. So what's the best process that we can use as an overlay? And that's really what started me on the path to coining the phrase. I thought I coined the phrase. I should correct it. Others have used it in different contexts. Uh, In the context of hiring decisions, let's say, how do you recommend combining facts with social proof for for the best outcomes. Yeah, and oh that concept of social proof is so good. <laughs> Should I talk a minute about that yeah, for your listener? Do. Do. Your listeners might all be wise to this. Social proof is a, is a way that people can have influence. It's written and studied quite a bit by Bob Cialdini who's a mm. professor emeritus at Arizona State. Has he, has he been on your program, Jeff? He is not, but I'm jealous for the fact that you call him Bob and not Robert. <laughs> well, I can maybe introduce you. Ooh, uh, ooh. I know him. I don't know him well. We're not BFFs or anything, but um, I did get to interview him for my first book. His oh, work wow. is very instrumental. Mm. Social proof is a simple concept. If I say Jeff Brown is great, his podcast is amazing, you should all subscribe to it. It's better than you saying that. Sure. So it's there's a social aspect to it. So social proof, I when I help a leader rewrite their bio, I'm always asking them to put in a quote from some big important person that mm. says, you know, Steve Smith led our supply chain da 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 to achieve this result and it was worth this many millions of dollars. Mm. That's a great thing to merge. Right. If you only have social proof and nothing else, that's you might be getting conned. Mm. But if you have a substantive fact base, like you you know that the person was with these companies, they did these things, um, you've interviewed them, you've had them evaluated maybe by somebody like me, although I don't do a lot of that anymore. Part of my job was to ferret out what are the risks and where do you need to probe more with this person? I like to see people really merge a lot of things. And that's true for leadership. I like to see leaders read all kinds of books, for example. I'm guilty of reading mostly nonfiction. As am I. Yes. Breadth, 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 breadth is just a, just a great thing. Mm. I'd love for you to share a real world example, let's say, of a, of a high stakes uh, leadership decision that was handled exceptionally well, and then maybe contrast that with one that wasn't or maybe didn't turn out so well. Well, that list of the bad actors is long, isn't it? <laughs> it's, I think that the the leader that comes to mind that it exemplifies a great decision uh, was actually on the news this morning, and that's Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. Um, uh, it's you know I'm sure you know and your listeners know that GM and Ford have both struck a deal with Tesla, and uh, they're we're moving towards something I think which will be good for all of us in the future Mm. is to um, standardize the electrical charging system Mm -hmm. in the United States so that if you have a Ford truck or a GM something or a Tesla in the future, you'll be able to charge your car Mm. in a common place, which is really good. So I want to celebrate Mary Barra though for something she did when she was a brand new CEO at GM and she's been there while now. I don't know how long. When she joined, they'd had the infamous um, ignition problem and they had um, problems with the cars. People actually lost their lives. 
as a result. And they ended up being found responsible Mm -hmm. and it cost them reputation. They had reputational loss. They had financial loss. And what Mary did when she became CEO was she said, and this is meta leadership in action. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know how it happened. She was looking to find the real institutional, organizational, systemic, either causes or supports Mm. for the bad decisions that individuals make. A lot of leaders, when there's a crisis, they look for who to blame. There indeed might be people to blame, but if you look for cause, you'll find that out anyway. So she actually went after culture as the root cause. And I deeply admire her for doing that. She's turned out to be an exceptionally good leader. You reminded me of a book I've recently listened to called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World by uh, David Epstein. He talks about the Challenger disaster yes. and digging into the whys of, of that happening and, and just the way they approached problems and coming at things, having to have evidence all the time. And there were numerous situations where people had hunches, but they didn't feel comfortable sharing those hunches because they didn't have evidence to back it up. Right. But had they done so, had they been in a culture where that was acceptable, they could have avoided a disaster. Right. If we had only known about Amy Edmondson and her work on psychological safety, mm. you know, that would right. have, I don't know if it, it, mm. it would have helped. I can tell you, I grew up eight miles south of, of Cape Canaveral. Mm. And it was freezing the day the Challenger launched. It's never freezing in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Mm. I don't remember a day when I moved north all the way to North Carolina and we had freezes. I was like, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> so so they they had tested and assembled the rocket and the boosters and everything in normal temperatures. And then they had abnormal mm. temperatures and they didn't put two and two together. And yeah. that's just still... So sad to me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about emotions because those often come up in high stakes situations, right? Yeah. How, how can leaders manage the impact of their emotions on, on their thinking and their behavior in particular during high stakes situations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they don't have me riding shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and they should. They should. Uh, uh, well, you know, I, uh, I, I really love the, the work I do. And one of the reasons I love it is that it's it's based on a relationship that allows me to say to a leader, you know, I can refer to their emotions and how, how I see it. And I'll often say as a hypothesis, I have a hypothesis, is this happening to you right now? Mm. You know, are you worried that this decision, if it goes badly, will make you look really stupid in front of the board and you might get fired? Mm. See, that's emotion. But we don't like to talk about that. So there's some really great work that's been done by neuroscientists in the last few years. And Lisa Barrett Edelman, I might have her name wrong. Let me look. Uh, It's Lisa Feldman Barrett. It's a neuroscientist, I believe, at Northeastern University. And she writes very well for people who are not neuroscientists, so we understand. Mm -hmm. We know that emotions are always part of, you, you can't ever put your emotions to sleep any more than you can put your brain to sleep. And goodness knows we don't want to put our brains to sleep or we'd be dead. (laughs) But in practical terms, let's go from the neuroscience to, well, what do I do about that? Mm. I encourage everyone, whether you're leading a big company or you're making a decision about your fifth grade child that the school has called and said, we want them to skip the next grade. And you're agonizing about the decision. Notice what's happening physiologically because that's where emotions show up first. We label them with our brain, but we experience them in our body. Your stomach flips over, your chest gets tight, the back of your neck is like feels creepy, your scalp crawls, your palms sweat. Um, some people do this with their foot when they're anxious. And by the way, just because they're doing that doesn't mean they're anxious. So that body language stuff gets tricky. So I encourage um, leaders to use emotion as a clue. Just think of it as a clue and say, what might this mean? Am I suspicious of what this person is telling me? How can I use it as constructive skepticism rather than dichotomizing and and saying, I don't like it. They're lying to me. You Mm. see, that's leaping. Mm. You can actually use your emotions to help you be more logical. I know. Crazy idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, you list some questions uh, in the book that leaders should ask themselves in order to better understand some of the factors driving their decisions. What, what would be an example of a couple of those questions that we should ask ourselves? One of the questions to ask, this might be one in the book, <laughs> is when someone is advocating or someone's are advocating strongly for a particular position, you have to ask in, in as non-cynical a way as possible, what is the benefit to them of advocating for this? And ask yourself, what is the benefit to me of advocating for or making this decision versus that decision? One of the things that I help leaders do is to recognize and utilize the intangibles in their organization, to talk to people. For example, you're giving somebody feedback. You want to understand the intangibles that they want. We tend to focus on promotion, money, status. You know, oh yeah, people want, oh, people are coin operated. Actually, they're really not once they're paid enough, but ask them you know, what do you want to be learning? Ask yourself as a leader, what do I want to explore? You know, what am I curious about? So that's one of the questions you can ask. I think another question you can ask is, how do I typically respond in a situation that's like this? And a big warning sign is when you say to yourself, oh, I've been to this rodeo before. Really? Is it exactly the same rodeo? Are the clowns different? Is the ring different? You know, are the horses a little crankier? Or, I mean, it, the, things have a way of being different subtly. And when we over engineer and we create categories and then we use those almost uh, reflexively, we fail to detect small but important distinctions from situation to situation. And does putting some of those things into practice that you just described then, do they play a role in helping leaders cultivate wisdom to to achieve their their goals? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Short answer, yes. Yes, (laughs) Yes, they do. And the lovely thing about that is if you're, let's say you're leading a group, maybe you're leading a project team and everybody's saying, oh, we've done this before. Oh, we've seen this before. Off we go. Um, If you just say, actually, I want to, I want to look at this thing over here. And you point out the thing you want to look at and you ask a few questions like, this looks slightly different. Mm. Let's think about what the consequences of that could be if it, if it's different enough that it's going to matter. Maybe it's not, you know, just be very hypothetical about things. You don't have to be an expert all the time. What you're doing is you're expanding everyone's thinking and you're also modeling learning. Mm. You're modeling that you don't need to know the answer all the time. And that is incredibly important to wisdom. You know, wisdom is knowing what you don't know. Wisdom is getting help when you need it, asking for help when you need it. And it's it's hard for humans sometimes to do that, you know, especially if you're a leader that's really revered, you know, you might have like a metaphorically, you have a cape on and, uh, you know, you're sort of the hero. I love those uh, t-shirts in the Apple store where they say, I don't know if they have them anymore. Not all heroes wear capes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The guy that helps you with your laptop. Yeah. <laughs> He's a hero to me. Yes, definitely. Well, you mentioned Ford and, and GM and, and Tesla. How can meta leadership skills help organizations in overcoming the challenges of rapidly changing business environments like what those companies are, are seeing? Yeah. So I think when there's rapid change, it's very tempting to default to some kind of a routine about managing change. Of course, you have to know what change you're managing before you can manage the change. So if you don't know what it's going to be, it's a little bit different. It's a little more vague. Um, But in either case, what is really helpful is to lean out You know, that advice to lean in can be good sometimes, but it also narrows, it sort of constricts your aperture Mm. so you don't see as broadly. And so what leaders can do to manage in either case is to be very connected with what's going on in their organization. I say that to leaders and sometimes they just look at me like, are you kidding? Really? You want me to connect? (laughs) Like, I'm busy. Don't you know? You had to wait a month to see me or whatever. They're not wrong about that. 
And I, what I'm suggesting they do doesn't take a lot of time, but it's to get out of their office in informal ways. And what you're looking for is the pulse of the organization. You're looking for a two-minute interaction with a guy who sits in a cubicle or a woman who's at your reception desk where you make eye contact Mm. and you ask them, what do you like about working here? That's all you have to say. What do you like about... Because trust me, if they they have something they don't like, they'll probably tell you. (laughs) Um, This involves getting out of your routine. But if you give this practice 20 minutes twice a week, you'll have a much better pulse on your organization. Mm. Then you will know and understand how the decisions you make affect the people that work there. Mm. And you'll know and understand more about what the friction will be when you try to change something. A former leader, mentor of mine, I don't know if you got this from someone else, used to call something like that management by walking around. Yeah. <laughs> and he would yeah. just take the pulse of, you know, walk into your office and just start up a conversation, ask how things are going, that sort of thing. Um, one CEO told me he was in a retail business. And I said, you know, how many of your stores have you been in? And he was mm-hmm. like, oh, I can't go in stores because everyone knows me. And I leaned over and I said, actually, they don't. <laughs> you know, people who work on a retail floor in a big retail company mm. might know the name of the CEO. Right. Some of them will know the face, but many of them won't <laughs> because it's not relevant to their day to day existence. And that comes as quite a surprise <laughs> to some. So you looked at him and said, you know, that show Undercover Boss, you don't even have to go undercover. (laughs) You don't even need a wig. (laughs) You don't need a wig. You don't need glasses. You don't need anything. Oh, my God. That's (laughs) I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, I want to ask you a couple of questions, Constance, not directly related to the book, if I may. But before I do that, I always like to ask, what haven't I brought to the fore that you wished I would have? What questions have I not asked that you think we need to address from the book? Well, it's really not anything that you haven't asked. I think it's more uh, that that I haven't said some of what I'm thinking because you know we don't have all day here. Uh, but but one of the things that my early readers pointed out to me, and I will admit, it didn't occur to me as clearly as when other people told me this. Mm. They said, you know, I think anyone can use what you're offering in this book. Mm. You know, as an author, you have to define your audience. Right. And so the audience I know the best are business leaders. But really, I'm a clinical psychologist. I understand human beings and I'm really super interested in people. Mm. And and so someone said, can you think of an example where just an ordinary mom, I don't know, I don't think being a mom is all that ordinary. It's hard work. <laughs> Um, an ordinary mom, a dad, a parent could use this. And I immediately went to my example about you got a kid in fifth grade, the school calls, they want the kid to skip. You have to think about how emotionally ready is your child Mm. to be with older kids. You know how smart they are. You know that they're academically gifted. Mm. Okay, we got that. You have to think about the effect on maybe they have siblings in the family you have to think about what, how that's going to change your life. You have to think about the trajectory. You might lie awake at night just as much as a CEO making a very consequential decision. Mm. The thinking process can be used. The emotions could be identical. And then you can also say, what are my habits of behavior? Do I, as a parent, always grab the next opportunity for my really smart kid? If I do, is that always the right way to go about the decision? So that that's the thing that I missed, um, that it really is has utility more broadly than I thought when I was writing it. Mm, that's a good point. Uh, last time that I talked to you, yeah. hard to believe it was 291 episodes ago. <laughs> oh my, well, yay, congratulations wow. to you. Almost, almost six years. Uh, I asked you about some of your most impactful or, or favorite books or books you like to recommend. I didn't prep you for this, but I'm going to reference the books you mentioned last time and challenge you not to include those this time. <laughs> okay, sure. I, I don't think I, I, yeah, I bet I won't. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, last time you mentioned some of your favorite books being Mindset, The New Psychology of Success by Carol oh. Dweck. Uh, you mentioned uh, <laughs> you mentioned Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us by Daniel Dan Pink. Pink. Yeah. And you mentioned Thinking, Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, so yes. I ask again, without mentioning either of those, what books lately maybe have, have been impacting you? Okay. My new obsession 
is this book. I, I, I have it on my desk. So I just grabbed it. This is called Outlive. It's by Peter Atia, MD. He has a podcast called The Drive. The Drive. Okay. About drive and me. I don't know. I'm seeing a theme here. <laughs> Peter Atia is an MD. He's one, he's a rare physician who thinks like a scientist, understands scholarly research, can mm-hmm. read it and extract meaning. And he can say, well, the researchers reported that it means this, but it doesn't mean that. And here's why. Here's wow. the evidence. Here's the spurious correlations. This man's speaking my language. Also, Outlive is, is a guide to living a vibrant life. He talks about longevity, but what he means is that you live long and well. And so I just love it. It's actually already changed some of my habits. It changed the blood work I asked my physician to do. His podcast is free and Mm. you can learn a lot from listening to him. My second book is a real departure from that one. And I have it on my desk too. I also, (laughs) the other ones that you mentioned, Mindset driving. I could grab those <laughs> by just turning my chair because um, they're always an arm tree. But this, you see all my. Ah, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont. She is profound and she is hilarious. And she writes these just sardonic. There's a poem in here about how it's written to a person from a group of friends. And it basically says, yes, we get together and talk about you and t- talk about all your flaws and you know, yada, yada, yada. And it's just, it's so, you would think it was mean as heck, but it's really (laughs) profound. Um, And so bird by bird is just, it's one of my, I've read it twice. I've read it out. I'll say to my husband, whatever you're doing, you have to stop. I have to, I have to read you this. (laughs) You might do that at your house too. I I suspect you might. As a matter of fact, uh, not only do I do that, but oftentimes my wife will be in another room and she'll be like, are you, are you talking? To yourself? I'm like, no, I'm just reading out loud. <laughs> oh, you know, it's my editor at Forbes. When I started writing for Forbes five years ago, said, if you really want to understand what you wrote and how it comes across, pin it out, stand up and read it mm. out loud. Wow. I mean, I go back and take whole phrases out now. It's like, I don't need yeah. that. You know, I work with, uh, on occasion, I do uh, these weekend workshops with a colleague with physicians. Primarily, sometimes lawyers and, and, and other uh, service yeah. providers, but mostly physicians. And we train them in a weekend how to launch a podcast and a YouTube uh, channel. But one of the things we make sure they do is before you come in and sit down and record a video, you need to read aloud what you wrote a minimum of three times. And we repeat it over and over and over to them. Re- read it out loud three times. And if they don't do that, they won't have realized that they've written things that don't sound like them. But as soon as they say it out loud, They'll, they'll catch mistakes. They'll catch, well, I wouldn't actually say it that way. Well, don't write it that way. You know? So anyway. Right. But also I want to point out that your workshops are in uh, way more valuable than if they're doing that on their own in their office. You're there, your colleague is there and you're reflecting back, you're holding up the mirror and reflecting back, which is exactly why mastermind groups are, or workshops like this, where they're live. I mean, they could be virtual, but they're live. Mm. And you say something I learned yesterday, yesterday, I can't make this up. <laughs> I'm in a mastermind group mm. and we met yesterday afternoon and we were all, you know, we got an assignment live. So we all got our heads down for 15 minutes or whatever we're writing. And then we put it up on a screen and my colleagues in mastermind keep saying, you write like Dr. Derrick's. You talk mm-hmm. like Constance. <laughs> you need to write like Constance because she is a lot more interesting. <laughs> and they are right. They mm-hmm. are right. So when I write a book or, or an important article, I have to write it the way I'm just going to write it the first time. Mm-hmm. But then it becomes the you know what first draft that Anne Lamott talks about. Every mm-hmm. first draft is right. so. It's part of the process, right. and I've I've just gotten a sense of humor about it. I'm like, oh, that is so academic. Ugh, <laughs> no one wants to read that, not even me. Uh, yeah, the thing I struggle with more than anything with with writing and writing my first book. Uh, and yes, I'm saying first out loud on purpose because I'm yes, trying to grow up the courage to write a second one. You will. Um, the thing I struggle with the most was trying not to edit 
as I wrote. That's something that I just naturally want to do. And of course, that elongates the process. Uh, not, but not only that, it's just not the way to write. It's just, you've got to get that first draft out there and know that it's going to have warts and worry about that later. Oh, I throw out whole pages. <laughs> I, it takes me three paragraphs to get good. But if you push yourself, if you say, I'm going to write for 20 minutes, and I'm only going to put down what ne- comes out naturally, you'll start writing. Yeah. Love that advice. So I'll look for your second book. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of great writing, what a segue. I'm, I'm such a pro. Uh, you want to pick, I'm kidding. You want to pick up meta leadership from Constance, how to see what others don't and make great decisions. It is a great book. I highly recommend it. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate your time. And we'll have to make sure we don't wait another six years to do this again. Well, I got to get another book out, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to find out more about Constance, check out the links and resources we talked about or connect with her online. The best thing to do is go to the show notes page created just for this episode. And you will find that on my website at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 481 for episode 481. And remember that other URL I mentioned at the top of the show to find out more about our Read to Lead Plus membership inside our Read to Lead community. It's all at jeffbrown.me. We'd love to have you as our newest member. Again, jeffbrown.me. Entrepreneur and star of ABC's Shark Tank, Damon John, says of next week's featured book, a must read tackling loneliness and improving belonging at work should be a priority for every organization and leader. This book is timely, crucial, and practical. He's talking about the book Connectable, how leaders can move teams from isolated to all in. It's written by Ryan Jenkins and Stephen Van Cohen, and it's Stephen joining us on the show next time fantastic book. I absolutely loved it. Well, that does it for this week. Hope to see you next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.